I would like to welcome you all to the fourth seminar of the AI and CSS seminar series. Today, uh, we have actually a very interesting and a very informative seminar. Um, Professor Dr. Denis Uret is with us. It is a great pleasure to be hosting uh, his talk. Um, he obviously does not really need an introduction. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with his work, but I would like to start with a uh, brief biography um, of Professor Duret. Um, he is a professor of computer engineering at Koch University and is also the founding director of the um, Artificial Intelligence Center. He holds a bachelor's in uh, electrical engineering, a master's in electrical engineering and computer science, and a PhD in computer science, all from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He also did a postdoc at MIT's uh, Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And before joining our computer engineering department as faculty, he co-founded Incura. Um, Professor U.S. research interests lie in the areas of natural language processing and machine learning. Um, my own research benefited immensely from his work, so uh, I would like to thank again um, Dr. Yuret for uh, giving us this talk today. Without further ado, um, I will give the floor to uh, you, Hoja. Uh, thank you, Miri. Thank you for having me. Um, so let me share my uh, screen again. Now, this talk was a bit uh, challenging to prepare because we have uh, participants from many different backgrounds, some technical, some not technical. So what I want to do uh, in this uh, talk is basically um, um, explain how we got here. I guess we've all heard of AI by now and its impact on uh, various technologies and scientific endeavors. Um, but basically AI didn't uh, come out of nowhere during the last 10 years, even though it actually made a great splash. Uh, there's a bit of a history uh, behind it. And I think understanding that history and uh, what the foundations are uh, will hopefully give us a better pers perspective to judge uh, the developments uh, today. Uh, so I want to basically go beyond the doom versus hype discussion that you often see in popular media. You know, you, you have some authors that are claiming or some um, intellectuals that are claiming that AI is going to take over and uh, take all our jobs and stuff. And, uh, you know, some people might claim that this is a hype, like some of the other hypes that we've seen over the last few years. Um, let's judge for ourselves uh, and see um, what it's all about. So the thing, um, AI has many different uh, subfields. Uh, these include language understanding, machine vision, uh, uh, machine learning, robotics. Uh, but basically the subfield that is most responsible uh, for the um, impact that it's made in the last few years is machine learning. So I want to start by describing uh, machine learning for uh, sort of uh, non-specialist people. So people who already know, please excuse the review. So this is basically my one semester course uh, squeezed into three slides. So the, in machine learning, what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, learn a mapping from some inputs to some outputs. So to make this more concrete, let's assume we're trying to do machine translation and inputs are English sentences, outputs are Turkish sentences, okay? And we know that humans can do this, do this so there is an unknown process in the human brain, uh, at least for bilingual speakers that can turn, you know, uh, these English words to Turkish words, but we don't know how it works. So what we try to do is we try to um, replace this unknown process or model this unknown process with a program, okay? So this program has various features that are important technically. So it has to be a parametric program. It has to have lots of uh, adjustable parameters. Uh, the operations in this program need to be differentiable. Uh, these types of programs are usually known as neural networks or deep learning models. But the important thing is we're basically trying to model this unknown process uh, with a flexible program that can model many, many different mappings from these inputs to outputs. Uh, when machine learning starts, we basically initialize this program randomly. 
So basically, we uh, it generates some random mappings from English words to Turkish words, and uh, we introduce something called a loss function or error function. So what is this function? Well, on the top left here, we see the actual uh, input output mapping. These are the actual translations from English sentences to Turkish sentences, let's say, that are done by human experts. And down below, uh, there is the you know, inputs uh, going through our differentiable program leading to some predictions. And the loss function or the error function is something that compares the outputs of our program with the desired outputs that we got from the human experts and measures the difference. Okay, so we get a single number at the end uh, for each sentence or for each set of sentences we feed into the system. Uh, at the end of this process, we get a single number and this number basically tells us how far we are uh, from the ideal um, outputs. Okay? And then uh, basically the, uh, the rest of the uh, problem is automated. Uh, we give this whole setup uh, to one of the deep learning frameworks uh, like PyTorch or TensorFlow or you know the one I'm working on called Knet. And these programs take care of the rest. What do they do? They basically adjust the parameters in this differentiable program in order to reduce this error function. And they keep adjusting it until the outputs of the program look a lot like the outputs of the unknown process we were trying to model. And maybe surprisingly, this uh, method works um, with great generality. Um, right now, when you use Google Translate, this is the uh, program that actually, this is the type of program that uh, takes care of the translations. When you actually ask Google a question using your voice, this is the type of program that understands your words. When you show Google your photographs and it identifies different people in your photographs, this is the type of program that works. All of these problems were challenging AI problems uh, during the last few decades. And since we, we were able to successfully train large enough differentiable programs using this method, uh, we made great progress on all of them. So I'm going to go back and uh, um, give, give you some history about how we get, got here. Uh, so I, I will divide this into three sections because these uh, types of deep learning uh, machines, um, you know, have an interesting uh, popularity graph. They first became popular in 1950s and 60s under the name of perceptrons. Um, so I call this the first deep learning evolution. Uh, the machines weren't very deep at the time because there weren't, you know, many computers that had uh, great computational capacity. In fact, Rosenblatt, when he was working on the um, perceptron, he was an electrical engineer, so he literally built the thing out of you know, wires and uh, spare parts. And on the left side here, you see one of the first problems uh, that he applied it on, which is still a toy problem that we start uh, with in our classes. So you see a giant C letter on the wall, and there's a huge TV camera. And uh, the task is basically to train a machine to recognize which letter uh, is on the wall. So it's uh, sort of um, recognition of optical character recognition, if you will. So that was one of the first problems. Now, this was uh, a great, uh, created a great excitement at the time. Why? Um, number one, for a while, for about 50 years, we knew that our brains uh, actually consisted of these functional units called neurons. And neurons pr pretty much worked by um, collecting a bunch of input signals from these uh, input branches called dendrites accumulating these signals in the cell body. And then once the accumulation passed a certain threshold, uh, they send the pulse out uh, from their output channels called the axons. Um, so a perceptron was a really, really simplified um, mathematical model of a single neuron, if you want to think about it that way. So um, we basically model all the inputs to the perceptron with a bunch of variables, x1 through xn. Uh, we model the strength of the, each of these connections using a weight, W. So those, are, those become the parameters of our model. So we multiply each X with the corresponding W, if you will. These are all numbers uh, in the perceptron. And we add them up in the body of the cell. 
So we basically have a linear combination of all the x's multiplied with all the w's. And if this sum exceeds some threshold, we output a one, otherwise we output a zero for some uh, implementations or minus one in other implementations. So that's it. So that's basically a perceptron, a very simple model uh, of a biological neuron. Now, what was new, what created all this excitement is for the first time in history, we were able to figure out how to train these from examples, okay? So it's one thing to write a program like this and then somehow figure out maybe by fiddling uh, and trial and error, what the ideal W's should be, for example, to recognize the letter C or the letter A. Uh, but it's another thing to have an automatic learning algorithm and show it enough examples and have some way to modify these weights that eventually the machine learns by itself. So that was the revolution basically perceptrons uh, brought. It was one of the first uh, learning algorithms uh, that worked. So here is the perceptron algorithm. The details are not important. I won't uh, quiz you at the end, I promise. Uh, but it's a very simple algorithm. I mean, literally uh, you look at an example uh, and if you guess it right, then you don't do anything. If you guess it wrong, then you subtract that example from your weights. So that, that's about it. That's the whole algorithm in two, three sentences. And it's a miracle that this works and it eventually learns. Um, so mathematicians jumped in on the bandwagon and they actually proved uh, that um, for a certain class of problems, the learning is guaranteed. After seeing enough examples, this machine always learns the right answer, okay? But the, uh, the key word there is for a certain class of problems. Not all the problems were uh, suitable for perceptrons. Uh, in particular, for a perceptron to learn a concept really well, that concept had to be linearly separable, um, uh, had to have a linearly separable boundary uh, from the other concepts. So this is a very simple example. Let's say we're trying to distinguish cats from dogs. And we represent each example, cat or dog, uh, in two dimensions, domestication and size. So the first few examples show us that, you know, the cats are of, you know, medium domestication and uh, small size. And our first dog example is kind of a large size and highly domesticated. And then we get more and more examples. And this line in the middle that I'm drawing between the cats and dogs, is basically what the perceptron represents. So the more examples you add to this picture, the line will move to accommodate the new examples, okay? But at some point, you're going to either get a very large cat or a very small dog or some exception. And basically there won't be a line that can separate the cats and dogs. When that happens, the perceptron cannot learn perfectly anymore because it can only represent lines. And if your data is not separable by lines or in higher dimensions, we call them hyperplanes, uh, then the perceptron won't be able to learn perfectly. And the learning guarantees I talked about that the mathematicians have proved no longer apply. So this was all summarized in a book written about 10 years later called Perceptrons. Uh, this was written by two MIT researchers, Marvin Minsky and Samuel Peppert. And it really are basically laid bare all the limitations of these, these new learning machines. And they listed a whole set of problems that uh, these machines could never learn. And as a sort of um, our prime hope of creating, you know, human level intelligent AI, uh, people did not take perceptrons seriously anymore after reading this book. And in fact, uh, in the US, the funding for neural net research dried up uh, for at least 10 years after the publication of this book. So there, there goes our first um, revolution. It lasted about 10 years. Uh, we figured out um, how a learning algorithm works. Uh, we invented an algorithm. Uh, mathematicians proved that this algorithm works for a certain class of problems. And then some other mathematicians wrote a very pessimistic book saying this thing will never solve uh, problems that are a bit more complicated and then the excitement fade for about 20 years, okay? So for about 20 years, nobody except a small number of really adamant people uh, worked on uh, neural networks. So that brings us to the second revolution, which started around the time I actually arrived at MIT. So this revolution um, basically is um, exemplified by 
what we call multi-layer perceptrons. This is a very simple idea. Uh, this was the sort of book that popularized this idea. Uh, the simple idea is this, if one perceptron or one neuron can't learn something, well, obviously our brain doesn't have one neuron. It has a network of neurons that are connected to each other. So why don't we just connect a bunch of neurons to each one bunch of perceptrons to each other and form a network of these perceptrons and try learning with them, okay? So that was the simple idea. Now, why didn't people think of the simple idea for 20 years? Well, of course they did. But as usual, again, the problem was the learning algorithm. So you could actually uh, put together a bunch of perceptrons like this uh, in a network, and you could prove that this type of uh, network structure could learn quite complicated problems, but you didn't know how to train them. The simple perceptron algorithm I showed you in the beginning doesn't work for this machine. Okay, so it was uh, the learning algorithm that was challenging, and that took some time to figure out. But eventually we did. Uh, we put some nonlinear functions between layers, technical detail. Uh, we basically reinvented calculus. We, uh, you know, used the chain rule and said, oh, uh, it turns out we can take derivatives uh, of the loss function with respect to each of our parameters, no matter how deep the network is. And if you're able to take these derivatives using the chain rule, then you know exactly which direction to uh, move each weight in this uh, big system in order to reduce the loss function. Remember in the very beginning, I showed you this graph where you have a differentiable program that's trying to solve a problem. And then we define a loss function or error function that tells us what the difference between our answers and the real desired answers are. So that was the loss function. Uh, basically what this backpropagation algorithm does is it finds how sensitive that loss is to each of the weights or parameters in the system. And uh, it tells us which way to move each weight or parameter in order to reduce uh, that loss. And if you basically adjust each of your parameters, some small epsilon amount in that direction and keep repeating this, eventually um, these machines also learn. So that was the uh, back propagation algorithm. Uh, and people proved that it could actually learn arbitrarily complex functions. In fact, mathematicians proved this awesome theorem called the universal approximation theorem, which said there are no limits to what a neural network can learn. So this is literally true. If you have a finite number of samples and given enough, uh, enough units, enough perceptrons that are tied up in a network, you can always learn that particular data set perfectly. So we have to take this with a grain of salt uh, because you know, if you say, if we found the secret of universal learning, why wasn't AI solved in 1986, right? So if you basically have a super duper learning machine that can learn everything, then uh, that means we can solve any problem. We can teach it how to speak, we can teach it how to see. Well, the issue was in the details, the fine print of this universal approximation theorem. It said it can learn anything provided that we have enough examples, number one. And number two, the network is large enough, okay? So for number one, we almost never have enough examples of the thing we're trying to learn. And for number two, especially for some um, special problems, the number of units that you need might grow exponentially, okay? So both of those uh, um, conditions for this universal approximation algorithm to apply uh, might be quite challenging. That's why AI you know, was not solved in 1980s. Um, and about 10 years after the second craze about neural networks started, um, a mathematician wrote a book called Support Vec, you know, the nature of statistical learning theory, introducing a different type of learning machine called support vector machines. And uh, this sort of ended sort of, uh, or at least slowed down the excitement about neural networks because for the problems at the time, support vector machines were actually better. They performed better, they learned quicker, they learned with less data, they generalized better. So people said, well, you know, neural networks, you know, they're fine and stuff, but now that we have these support vector machines, um, who needs them? Uh, so again, except for a few um, diehards, <clears throat> uh, people switch to other types of learning, uh, Bayesian learning, kernel-based learning actually became big topics in that period. Uh, until about um, 
2012, which brings us to the current uh, revolution that we're in now. Uh, so this is the sort of period of deep architectures. That's why it's called deep learning. So what is a deep architecture? A deep architecture is basically just a neural network with more and more layers and more and more units. Okay, it's bigger and larger. So uh, you might ask, you know, why, why didn't people in 1986 think of making their networks bigger and larger? They probably did, but they couldn't succeed in training them uh, for various reasons. Number one, the hardware wasn't enough. And number two, the data sets weren't large enough to train the large networks. Um, and number three, the algorithms weren't enough. As you make these networks very, very large, this backpropagation algorithm of taking derivatives actually becomes more challenging because the derivatives of the initial layers or the sensitivity of the loss to the initial layers become, make, might become really, really small. So you don't really know which way to go uh, with these weights in order to improve the loss. So for algorithmic reasons, for computational reasons, for data reasons, 1980s did not have a deep learning uh, revolution. We had to wait until 2012. What happened in 2012? Well, image processing is one of the uh, main problems that AI has been dealing with since 19, uh, at least 50s and 60s. Um, in fact, uh, uh, one of the stories told at MIT uh, is uh, a professor of mine, um, uh, Sussman. Uh, when he was an undergrad, he went to work at the MIT AI lab as an uh, undergrad research assistant. And at the time, AI Lab was just uh, getting started. They have a huge amount of funding from DARPA. Uh, they bought all these um, gadgets, robots, etc. And they had a camera. So Minsky told him, OK, here's a camera. Hook it up to the computer and you know, solve computer vision uh, to an undergrad for a summer research uh, task. Okay? So Sussman worked very hard that summer and could not solve computer vision which is not surprising because after that, we were tried to solve computer vision for another 50 years. And you know, hundreds and thousands of PhDs later, uh, we still haven't completely solved it. So it wasn't a, a big failure on his part, uh, but he never worked on computer vision again. So that's probably a, a, a sad part of the story. Um, and then um, Marvin basically went to his funders and he said, okay, we need to attack this problem called computer vision and uh, you need to give us some money to investigate this. And uh, the story goes, the generals at the time who were funding this research said, why don't you just hook up a camera to the computer? And Minsky says, we did. And the general said, then what's the problem? You know, just look out the camera and see. So you see, seeing and interpreting what we see is such a natural part of the human experience that we don't realize what a difficult problem it is. When a computer looks out a camera um, in the world, what it sees is basically a, a matrix of numbers. Okay, so for each location, each pixel in your, in your photograph, there is three numbers that represent how much red, how much green, how much blue it is. If I gave you all these numbers, and I said, okay, here's a bunch of numbers. Please find the cat in this picture. You would have a hard time too. Nobody knew how to basically look at those numbers and figure out there's a cat in there, okay? So uh, this brings us to 2010. So it's been at least 50 years since people have been trying to solve this problem, looking at a picture and figuring out there's a cat or a dog in it. And uh, for the first time in history, uh, some folks at Stanford created this humongous data set called uh, um, and organized this challenge called the ImageNet Large Scale with Visual Recognition Challenge. This data set had about a million, one million pictures, all hand labeled. Okay, so somebody actually sat down and said, okay, in this picture, there's a cat, in this picture, there is a dog, literally. And uh, so a million pictures, a thousand categories, um, and a lot of time and effort later, they came up with this challenge. And every year they organized a competition. And this competition attracted the best research teams from around the world. Uh, people tried their best algorithms on it. And in 2012, something interesting happened. Uh, namely, the first time uh, entry by Jeff Hinton and his students 
won the competition. Not only that, but uh, you're basically looking at this chart as the error rate of various programs. And you see you know, very, very good machine uh, vision research teams from ISI, Oxford, Xerox, Amsterdam. These are uh, used to be the best teams in computer vision. And their error rate is right here about 26%, 28%, close to 30%. And suddenly for the first time, this new approach that Hinton and his students introduced cut the error rate in half. They actually achieved 15% error rate in this task. Okay, so that attracted everybody's attention. Not only that, they weren't using any of the algorithms these other, other guys were using. All they used was a neural network. Okay, so they this was basically the uh, one of the first unequivocal demonstrations that neural networks can solve a com complicated problem that other um, other approaches fail. Um, so how did they succeed? As I said, you know, big networks is not a very difficult idea to come up with, but it took us 30 years to figure out how to train these big networks. So there's four components uh, to, that contributed to the success. One was the large labeled data set. So in 1980s and 90s, when we actually uh, did research on neural networks, uh, we trained them on hundreds of examples, maybe thousands of examples if lucky. ImageNet had a million examples, so that was a big factor. Um, the networks were huge and deep. So can I, I don't know if I can show you this, uh, the real graph here. So these are some neural network architectures uh, from the uh, years following and preceding 2012. So before 2012, the, you know, for one of the first commercially successful um, neural networks was called Lenet, which was used for digit recognition on sort of checks and receipts and stuff. And you know, the boxes here are not important. They just represent the number of layers of units in this network. So it was relatively deep, but not too deep. And then came AlexNet, which won the 2012 competition. And as you can see, it's you know quite deeper. And then two years later, uh, we had VGG and GoogleNet. And uh, as you can see, they get deeper and deeper. And then in 2015, you know, here's the entries. Okay. So these things were ridiculously large and deep compared to the um, old neural networks that we used to um, work with. So this is one reason why it's going called uh, deep learning. Um, so this is the uh, third factor, which is GPUs, uh, graphical processing units. So we didn't have GPUs back in 1986. GPUs are uh, basically chips that were invented by companies like NVIDIA uh, for gaming computers mainly. Right? A graphical processing unit basically allows your computer or laptop to display you know, realistic game um, scenes uh, efficiently and fast. So this technology that was basically invented first and foremost for teenagers to enjoy video games happens to also uh, be good at training neural networks. Uh, it turns out this type of graphical algorithm actually relies on a lot of linear algebra and convolution type operations. And those are the exact operations we need to train neural networks. So in 2012, uh, Hinton's student, um, Alex Krzyzewski actually wrote, uh, took one of the GPUs at the time and wrote a C++ library that basically used that GPU to train this large network. And uh, that, that's you know, one of the reasons why they succeeded where others failed because this type of network not only requires a lot of examples, but it also requires a lot of computation to be trained. And uh, this graph here uh, shows you both the falling error rate over the years in this task, and also the rising number of teams which actually use GPUs and deep learning. And you know, e even in 2014, you couldn't actually compete anymore without GPUs and deep learning. And these days, in order to be successful in any area of AI, almost, uh, you need basically uh, the necessary hardware and some expertise in deep learning uh, to apply to your area. Um, all right, so let me skip this for now. Um, 
what happened since 2012? This was eight years ago. So it's hard to summarize, but there is a lot of excitement in the air and the excitement is still continuing. I call this the gold rush uh, because be, being a PhD student these days is a lot of fun. There's a lot of old problems that when you try the new methods, you immediately get better results. Okay, this used to be a lot harder before 2010s. And now, um, you know, people basically are applying these new methods to every problem they can find uh, and, and beating the state of the art uh, systems. So um, one of the earliest examples was in reinforcement learning where DeepMind, a uh, London company later acquired by Google, um, trained a neural network that's learned how to play old Atari games uh, better than humans just by looking at the pixels and getting the feedback of the increasing score. It didn't actually know the purpose of the game or the rules of the game. It just randomly played with the joystick uh, and noticed the scores increase. And from that experience, it was able to um, you know, beat human champions in uh, roughly 50 games out of 80 or something. Um, the same team worked a couple of years more and they uh, were able to uh, win the world championship in Go. Uh, I was actually witness uh, to, um, in 1994, I think, where we beat the chess world champion, Kasparov, uh, with Deep Blue, the IBM computer. Uh, but the way we did it at the time uh, was by a lot of computation. So Deep Blue was able to evaluate 300 million moves a second, and Kasparov's brain, unfortunately, can only do about a, you know, hundred or a thousand operations a second serially. I mean, it has a lot of parallelism, but it can't actually compute uh, that many moves. Uh, so they were obviously thinking in very, very different ways. And one thing that was obvious to everyone is that in a game like Go, where the branching factor, the number of available moves is a lot higher, that type of brute force approach would never work. So nobody actually expected us to beat the Go champion um, uh, in, uh, in this decade. Um, so a few years before AlphaGo actually beat this, the best Go uh, programs could not even beat the teenage champion of the world, okay? So within a few years, uh, these guys applied uh, sophisticated deep learning techniques to the problem and were able to uh, remove another um, crown from an intelligence game uh, that humans used to be good at. Self-driving cars is a big thing right now, flying cars, self-driving cars. So I'm hoping that you know my, my daughter uh, is going to be at the age of getting her driver's license in the next uh, five years or so. I'm crossing my fingers so that you know the technology arrives here and I don't have to teach her how to drive and you can just tell your car to go anywhere you want. Although Istanbul traffic scares me, I think uh, AI, even AI is going to have a hard time uh, in Istanbul. But this, this whole thing was made possible again uh, by advances in deep learning. Um, people are training robots for you know, various tasks like walking. Um, I just wanna show you this one video though, because you know, when I talk about the, all the great things that deep learning and AI are making, I'm afraid I'm sort of um, encouraging this narrative where AI is coming uh, for our jobs and you know robots are going to take over and stuff. So this is actually a real um, robot competition challenge from a few years ago. So it's just basically uh, some examples to show you the state of the art. So even though we can beat the world champion in Go, it turns out walking and opening doors and carrying trays and you know seeing uh, stuff with your eyes happens to be still very challenging problems and, uh, and robots are still not very good at it. So I don't see these guys uh, taking our jobs anytime soon. On the other hand, I also saw the first DARPA competition for self-driving cars where um, they basically uh, invited a bunch of research labs and uh, universities uh, to compete uh, on a self-driving car competition. And the first time they did this, within the first kilometer, all the cars crashed, even though they were driving in an empty desert, okay? So that was the state of the art. Uh, the next year, 
Um, a couple of cars were able to finish. This was like a two, 300 kilometer um, uh, uh, race in Las Vegas in the desert. And there were some cars which were able to finish. And then five years after that, they were actually holding competitions in realistic scenarios with city streets and other cars and pedestrians driving. So the, the pace of advance can be quite fast as well. So, um, so the, these uh, robot examples should be taken with a grain of salt, but these are difficult problems. It turns out uh, one of the biggest things I learned from AI, things uh, we usually ascribe to intelligence, like taking integrals and playing chess and you know, doing math in your head, seem to be very easy problems compared to understanding language, being able to see and being able to move. So that's, uh, that's the lesson in AI, if there's any one lesson. Um, so there's a lot more examples I can go through. Speech recognition, we all use it now. Machine translation, I mentioned. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about is uh, multi-modal uh, multi systems, which can handle uh, more than one domain. So for example, vision and language. Well, a prototypical example of this is image captioning systems. So we now have AIs that can look at a picture like this and generate the caption that you see up top. Okay, so this means the, the AI has to master both uh, seeing, learning how to see and recognize uh, objects in the image and producing language and tie these two domains together. Um, so I think that is uh, going to be one of the um, driving uh, area factors going forward in both language understanding and general intelligence uh, systems that combine more than one modality. Um, so here's a, a little example that we worked on uh, a while ago. I don't know if uh, the sound is on. Okay, I'm going to So this is a little uh, piece of work we did uh, over a summer, which turned into a DARPA project uh, for sort of interpreting what you see and describing um, actions in the video. Uh, but what you saw was basically an artificial uh, uh, speaker, right? So you, you basically are used to seeing these uh, um, people who describe football games to you over the radio or TV. And this is what we were trying to do uh, at the time. The reason we wear these Star Trek suits was because Sajid, my friend in that video was you know, in charge of the um, computer vision and he wasn't using deep learning. So his algorithms were really bad. So we had to wear bright colors and use a phosphor green ball in order to, for the camera to recognize what's going on. Um, but these days, uh, basically um, we have sort of at the cutting edge programs that can uh, see videos like this and describe what they see. Um, in the other direction, we can also have programs that can visualize what you tell them. So this was sort of the, you know, vision to language direction. We can also go the other way uh, in the language to vision direction. This is uh, some work that my student did a few years ago. Program so this is a program that basically is supposed to imagine or visualize stuff that you type. So 
So we type the monkey is in the room on the table. So that's the sort of imagination direction. So this is the direction, if you will, if you're reading a novel or a book uh, of fiction and some things are happening in it, you can usually see what's going on in your mind's eye. And that actually allows you to understand the book deeper and answer questions uh, that are not obvious just from the given text. And right now, computers lack that ability because they can't imagine uh, properly what you're telling them. Uh, so they only know about what these words are uh, in terms of their dictionary definitions or what the, these words are in terms of all the other places these words were used in. But if you want to do real language understanding, we need to go beyond that and we need to tie these words to the real world uh, because Text only methods can only, um, I believe, get you so far. You need to connect language to the word, world to uh, make some real progress. This is another example where we teach a robot to navigate um, using natural language instructions. Again, uh, the robot starts by not knowing any words. Uh, we basically show it examples of students. You know, one student basically describes a path, you know, turn right, go up to the lamp, you know, take the road with the wood uh, tiles, etc. And the other student follows the instructions by seeing enough examples of this, the computer eventually figures out what what left means, what right means, what stop means, what go means, etc. And then it can actually understand and follow instructions that you give it. Um, so uh, there are some language models that actually generates uh, very high quality human sounding text. Uh, but the juries and you know, the popular thing to do these days is basically a journalist interviews, interviews one of these language models and asks it questions. If you've never seen one, uh, you can get pretty amazing looking. Um, okay, maybe we can't. All right, I'll... Uh, uh, so if, if you want to see examples of this, just Google GPT-3. That's the latest incarnation of such programs and they can generate amazing sounding um, a text. We can turn this text generation ability uh, to uh, for uh, gaming. Uh, when I was young and the computers were not very good at uh, graphics. We used to play text-based games. These are like choose your own adventure type games where the computer describes to you a scene and then you're a character in a story and you say go north and you know hit the dragon or you know steal the gold or whatever and then you progress through the story. And now we have AIs that can actually uh, come up with the story as you're typing things and a lot more uh, creative than what we used to play with back in the day. Um, I want to finish with this, which is uh, uh, the introduction to the deep learning lecture, uh, deep learning class from MIT uh, this semester. This year, I figured we could do something a little bit different. And instead of me telling you how great this class is, I figured we could invite someone else from outside the class to do that instead. So let's check this out first. And welcome to MIT SIPCAS 191, the official introductory course on deep learning taught here at MIT. Deep learning is revolutionary in so many fields, from robotics to medicine and everything in between. We all know the fundamentals of this field and how you can build some of these incredible algorithms. In fact, this entire speech and video are not real and were created using deep learning and artificial intelligence. And in this class, you'll learn how. It has been an honor to be with you today, and I hope you enjoy the course. So a little bit of behind the scenes. Hi, everybody, and welcome 
to MIT 6S191. Hi, everybody, and welcome to MIT 6S191, the official introductory course on Greek language here at MIT. So, uh, and I think that's all I want to say. So we're going to end with the current time period we're in, in terms of the AI calendar. We're in the third large deep learning revolution right now that started in 2010s. Uh, we knew sort of deep models could learn very efficient representations and solve uh, complicated problems, but we didn't know how to train them. But better algorithms, larger data sets, more GPU power, uh, enable us to succeed in this task. And for the last eight years, we've been sort of reaping the benefits of this. Um, what about the future? Uh, sometimes I joke and I say, when I prepared this lecture, I realized I did some numerology and I realized that basically every revolution lasts about 10 years, okay? And at the end of those 10 years, a mathematician writes a book and then people basically don't like neural networks anymore. And there's a 20 year gap. So if we run this forward, I'm going to predict in 2022, a mathematician is going to write a book and everybody is going to understand deep learning is uh, not ideal and we're going to forget about it until 2032. So that's my, <laughs> that. so joking aside though, I think uh, this time, AI and deep learning are here to stay. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is basically they have penetrated all of our technologies and systems and they have been commercially successful, which is something I can't say uh, for the 80s and 90s. I mean, there were some successes back then, but they weren't as widespread and in as many fields as they are today. So I think both deep learning and AI are here to stay. So we better figure out how to live with them. And with that, um, I'd like to take any questions if you guys have questions. Thank you so much, Ajam, uh, for this presentation, which was not only really informative, but also very inspirational. Uh, and on behalf of Glodem as well, I would like to thank you um, for, for sparing time uh, for this talk. Um, we can open the floor for questions. We already have two of them actually on the chat box. Um, I will read them out loud um, as People who will watch this later uh, will also get to uh, see them. I mean, hear the questions. Um, Arhun Oskan asks, how was the network structure determined? How many nodes and arcs, et cetera? I think this was a question that was asked during the presentation. Um, so I'll ask the second one. Anil Shan is asking, are deep learning approaches used in NLP research? Um, will deep reinforcement learning approaches have a positive effect on NLP research? Training time seems to be a big problem in reinforcement learning. Can we think that quantum computers could be a fourth revolution in this respect? Okay, so uh, I will answer yes to the first two questions. So yes, deep learning approaches are used in NLP research. In fact, these days you probably can't get a paper accepted to a deep learning um, natural language processing conference without deep learning in it. Um, deep, will deep reinforcement learning approaches have a positive effect? Sure, uh, deep reinforcement learning is getting some surprising results, although it's very fickle and it's a lot harder to train than regular supervised approaches. Uh, there are some problems that reinforcement learning uh, is needed to solve, and I, I believe that also can benefit language. Uh, the third, quantum computers, I'm skeptical. Uh, physicists yet need to convince me uh, that they can actually build uh, coherent enough and error-free enough quantum computers to be practically useful. Um, I don't think anybody series is expecting that to be uh, reality uh, at least in the next 10 years. So I don't see this in the near term. Um, so I think Uttar Toxos has a question if you would like to unmute yourself. 
Well, it, actually, it's not me because we're watching two people. So okay. it's Henry Mullins. So we're two people in the room. But I think maybe he would like to wait a little bit because I see yeah, that there is another there's question. Somebody else. So like you can return to us towards the end. Yeah. Thank you. But don't. Okay. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> okay. So the next question is from Esra Bilish. If and how these technologies help us to end pandemic and catch and prepare for the upcoming ones. Um, so uh, I'm not the expert, uh, sort of in the health applications of AI, uh, but I do think, uh, going forward, uh, it will have a positive impact. I know, and I have done some work on, uh, for example, microbiology, um, uh, you know, protein, protein interactions, uh, regulatory gene networks, etc. So biology is a field now that is generated lots and lots of data. And whenever you have a field that generates lots and lots of data uh, beyond the capacity of any one human to process, then AI uh, comes in handy. So the latest, I guess, exciting developments uh, that made the news was DeepMind uh, sort of solving the protein folding problem, which was a big step. This is a problem that people have been trying to solve for uh, several decades now. Uh, those types of advances will surely uh, be beneficial uh, for future health um, applications. Uh, the next question is from Barke Jesus. Um, is third revolution actually a revolution to point one with better hardware and larger labeled data sets? Okay, so yes, this is a question that's been asked before. Is there really new uh, that we're doing now that we weren't doing uh, in the 1990s? And the answer is, um, I mean, to some extent, the uh, architectures that are used today, most of them uh, were first thought of in 1990s, but their success wasn't proven until now because of these restrictions. But there are also new ideas. So it's not completely, you know, just scale the old ideas, right? So they're, they're right now, for example, in natural language processing, there's a new architecture called transformers that is breaking all the records. And Google is using it for analyzing your questions and translating your uh, texts. Uh, that wasn't invented until uh, 2015. Um, and some of the training techniques, I mean, the, the actual standard backpropagation algorithm from the 90s literally does not work when you apply it to these deep networks. So you need a lot of bells and whistles on top of that in order to make these things to converge to uh, a meaningful place. So there is definitely a lot of innovation as well. We have a second question from uh, Anil Shan, who happens to be one of the researchers of our lab um, with really interesting ideas too. So uh, this is not really nepotism. It's just, that's the next question. I'm reading it out loud. <laughs> um, the popularity of using deep learning methods in many research, especially in the field of social sciences is increasing. What kind of learning path would you recommend to students in this field? That's an excellent question also for, I think, for from our lab. Right, so um, double major <laughs> is the easy answer. I think everybody needs a computer engineering or computer science major in addition to whatever they want to work on. And that will enable you to become a, uh, a good data scientist and a deep learning engineer and will enable you to use these technologies yourself. But if you don't have a chance to do this, um, or uh, you can also do this online, it doesn't have to be an official diploma or anything. There is tons of material online, uh, both to learn uh, programming and computers and uh, deep learning. So a self-study uh, could also get you there. But if you don't have a chance to do either, then you need to collaborate. So our lab, for example, is open for collaboration with all the different uh, departments at Koch. Uh, we organized uh, meetings with each uh, group of faculty, with science, with social sciences, with uh, economics, uh, um, nursing, et cetera. And uh, in these meetings, we basically discussed, okay, here is the expertise that we have. What are some of the problems you guys think uh, can benefit from AI? And I'm hoping that those meetings will lead to some interdisciplinary uh, collaborations. Uh, I am right now um, collaborating with Erdem Hoca on a sociology project. 
Uh, I'm collaborating with Til Behoja on a language learning project uh, from the linguistics side. Uh, so I think uh, this, this type of co collaboration is um, good both for uh, the AI lab itself and for all the fields uh, that we're contributing to. And we're also hoping to knock on your door uh, for our project uh, very soon. Uh, Ardem Hujam is here to, oh, sorry, there is another question right before that. Uh, Emre Taylan Duman is asking, could overfitted model memorize or represent a noisy data? Right, good question. So overfitting happens to be a um, big problem in deep learning. As soon as you actually have a very complicated uh, little brain, deep neural network, and you try to train this on some finite amount of data, and all of our data sets, no matter how big we make them, they're still small. Uh, what happens is the network tends to memorize regularities in the training data that you may not actually want uh, to use. So uh, my favorite example is you know, from image recognition. So when people started visualizing what these image processing systems actually did, and how they classified cats versus dogs, et cetera. Um, they, they wrote programs to see what parts of the image the network was paying attention to when making certain classifications. And uh, they realized for this one model that uh, when distinguishing dogs from wolves, uh, the machine never looked at the animal itself, but the background. So it turns out in the data set, all the wolf pictures were from snowy areas and all the dog pictures were from non-snowy areas. So the network basically learned to distinguish snow from no snow, and instead of dog from wolf. Uh, same type of thing applies to uh, other applications of AI. For example, um, in this is more recent, I think in, uh, in, in, Ch in China or Japan, uh, a group claimed that they can actually look at a person's picture and figure out if they're going to, um, Com commit a felony, okay, if they're going to end up in jail. Okay, that was a very controversial uh, statement. Uh, but when other researchers analyzed their data set, which consisted of pictures of people from jail and pictures of people not in jail, they just realized that, you know, most people in jail don't smile in their pictures, whereas most people outside of jail smile in their pictures and the network was picking up on that. And that was the, you know, they, when they corrected for this, uh, the predictive ability of the network went away. All of these are examples of overfitting, and uh, there are things that we need to pay attention to when we're using these new technologies. Just because the network seems to be doing well on the data set you prepared does not mean it's giving the right answers for the right reasons. So you need to actually analyze why it's giving these answers and make sure um, it's got the right reasons. Thank you, Ajam. Uh, Ardam Hoja has a question. Ardam Yuruk, uh, what do you think about the future of the role of domain expertise, especially thinking about the computational social sciences? Will AI tend to become independent from social scientists as they shift from supervised to unsupervised learning accelerates? And future of AI indicate increased social science, computing collaborations, or will AI do the social sciences as well? Okay, so, so this is also a, um, a very good question and a very common one. Uh, my lawyer friends ask me if you know, their profession is at risk. My doctor friends ask me if their profession is at risk. Nobody's profession is at risk, okay? So AI is really, really bad right now. I know it's progressing and there's a lot of uh, excitement uh, around it. But in order to replace an actual human expert in any field, we're still uh, far, far away uh, from that goal. I mean, eventually, I believe that there is nothing physically preventing us from getting to human level AI, uh, but I don't see that happening uh, in the you know, next uh, decade or two. So all of your professions are currently safe, uh, and I think AI will be a, uh, a, you know, more and more capable assistant uh, in the coming years, hopefully. Thank you, Ajam. Uh, Mohammed Tolga Jangos has a question. Uh, what do you think about Ray Kurzweil's future predictions, especially related to his law of accelerating returns? Okay, I should say I like Ray Kurzweil. I don't agree with him always, uh, but uh, the, his first book on AI, 
I think it was called The Age of Intelligent Machines, was one of the reasons I got really interested in the AI area. It's a great book, uh, highly recommended. Uh, but most of his later predictions are predicated on this idea of exponential growth. Uh, so when you look at various fields like uh, computation per dollar, or you know, the cost of uh, um, analyzing the human genome, et cetera, all these technologies seem to be accelerating at an exponential rate. And Ray says, if they accelerate with this exponential rate, then in 10 or 20 years, we're going to have an explosion. There's going to be a singularity. Nobody can know what's going to happen next, et cetera. That relies on a very big assumption. And that big assumption is the exponential will continue, OK? However, in our universe, no exponential ever continues forever, OK? The reason is exponentials tend to go to infinity. And nothing in our universe is infinite. So basically, everything that looks like an exponential eventually turns into an S-curve. Okay? We just don't know when the, the top part of the S-curve will start. So if that starts in the next five years, then uh, you know, we're probably not going to see some of the things he's predicting. Uh, but when you actually look at his predictions, just know that he's curve fitting. And uh, the curves that he's fitting uh, are not always physically realistic. John. The next question is from Jack Loverich. How relevant was early conceptual work on machine translation by Weaver and Booth and others to the first revolution inaugurated by Rosenblatt? How has machine translation grown up alongside deep learning? Thank you. So uh, machine translation has an interesting history. So when uh, Weaver and Booth first started this, they basically, um, you know, uh, try to get a linguistic solution to the problem, you know, building dictionaries, building grammars, uh, doing it the proper uh, linguistic way. And, you know, that got us uh, to a, a certain level of accuracy. And in the 90s, we saw the statistical revolution. Uh, people said, oh, forget about linguists. Let's just look at the data and build statistical models. And this started in 1988, roughly, and uh, lasted for uh, you know, 15, 20 years. And uh, the reason um, uh, you know, this stuck around is because it worked. It actually worked better. You know, statistically learned models work better than human-generated um, rules, rule-based systems. Um, and then finally, uh, deep learning uh, came into the picture. And deep learning said, basically, throw away all those statistical models. Let's just have a neural network learn this whole thing. Now, when I first heard this, having worked on machine translation a bit before, I was very, very skeptical. I was so skeptical, in fact, I actually took a sabbatical and went to USC ISI to work with Kevin Knight, who was the leader in machine translation. And I spent that year building my own machine translation neural networks. I simply did not believe they would work. I mean, because Literally, they were saying, you take a Turkish sentence, you stuff it into a neural network, it turns it into a vector, and then you feed this vector into another neural network, and out comes French. Okay, how ridiculous, right? So if a PhD student came to me with this idea, I would probably throw them out of my room. But, you know, I went to ISI, we wrote the programs, and they worked. And uh, now, you know, I'm used to the idea, so it doesn't seem so incredible anymore. Uh, but yes, so there has been sort of two breaks in research. And I don't think, uh, you know, there's people who know this stuff better than me in the audience, Kemal Oja, uh, Rayan Oja, but I don't think we actually learn enough from the previous stage when we're excitedly working on the next stage. So the statistical guys did not pay attention enough to the previous rule-based linguistics-based approaches. In fact, uh, you know, the IBM head is, uh, um, rumored to have said, you know, the more linguists I fire, the higher my accuracy goes up or something. And then now that we're in the deep learning uh, area, we're not actually looking at what we learned during the statistical area, et cetera. So this intergenerational um, forgetting, unfortunately, happens to be a, uh, you know, repeating theme. Um, I also would like to actually take a moment to, to thank uh, Professor Kemal of Lazar. I noticed that he actually has posted really important information, useful ones for us in the chat box. Um, 
And also, if I am missing any questions, please do let me know. I think the next question is from uh, Giray Joshkun. Uh, do you think if the AI research will be dominated by deep learning models or other models will also have an impact in solving the complex problems? So I think deep learning is here to stay. So it's going to be in our toolbox. It's not going to be our whole toolbox, I don't think. Uh, but it's definitely going to be just like, you know, uh, standard search algorithms, uh, standard dynamic programming algorithms were part of our toolboxes all these years. Uh, these deep learning modules are also going to be uh, in our toolbox because there are certain functions that we simply cannot write by hand and that are best learned from data. And as long as those functions need to be implemented as part of your solution, you will have these little deep learning modules in your program. Now, is it going to be the whole thing or is it going to be a component of a you know, larger solution? Um, I don't know. I don't think it's going to be the whole thing, but if you tell, you know, ask me what the final solution is going to be, I have to say, I don't know. If I knew, I'd be rich and famous now. Thank you, Ajam. So as promised, I'm going back to Hendrik Bullins and Uttar Soxas. Um, you can omit yourself to ask the question. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Um, congratulations, Chapeau. You are doing really great things at Koch. Uh, in order to avoid that my uh, points sound a little bit uh, stupid, I, I have uh, to tell you that um, my background, I am an evolutionary economist and cognitive psychologist and I work in the uh, area of conflict and peace studies uh, which basically is just about uh, decision making, problem solving and prediction. So the areas are very close. Yes. Uh, especially what we have in common is the intelligence area. The difference is we in cognitive and neuroscience, we, we work with natural intelligence and your field is the, is the artificial intelligence. Now, I will limit my uh, comments, questions to two points which are related. Uh, in the part of the second revolution, <clears throat> you said uh, we introduced non-linearity, so different from the first revolution. And you give as an example uh, this decision tree or flow chart and uh, you talked about this what back propagation right. but as i understand it uh, i started by the way as a, a management consultant and we tried to optimize workflows and things like that so we used this model in the 70s already and in the 80s now my point is you said you introduced non-linearity but in fact, the arrow backwards is about feedback or feed forward. And both are linear. They are not nonlinear. And that is connected with my second point, uh, the difference between artificial intelligence and human intelligence. There is a second revolution going on in neuroscience cognitive psychology and the whole field. Uh, Nobel prizes like Kahneman, Richard Thaler. So how does the brain work? Yep. And the interesting thing is, and that is the second revolution, that to put it very briefly, it is believed uh, different from 15, 20 years ago, that maybe nine, that maybe 10, 5% of our thinking is conscious, 
and controlled. And that the biggest, far biggest part is uh, automated and unconscious. Um, the thing is that there is, there is no room for that in artificial intelligence. I, I didn't see anything about that. And now the most surprising thing is while the, while the human intelligence, the non-linearity, which is said to be uh, in charge of creativity, innovation, and out of the box thinking, um, is missing in the area of artificial intelligence, there's also the reverse thing. On conferences in neuroscience about the new science of thinking in cognitive psychology, etc., nobody talks about artificial intelligence. How is that possible? Do you know anything of connections, which are, I think, very much needed? Uh, thank, thank you for your... Uh... Very uh, informative comments. Yes, cognitive neuroscience is something that I also uh, follow. Um, you know, I'm very interested in. I'm not a, a big expert on them, but I try to follow the developments because they they always inspire us. After all, um, I must say we're all in the same business of trying to figure out intelligence. Different fields have their different methods. Um, so cognitive scientists try to model real systems. Neuroscientists try to model the wet work, and artificial intelligence researchers try to build computational models to see if some of the things we hypothesize actually work or not. I, I think the, these are all going to be um, necessary to fill different parts of the puzzle. Now, in the linearity versus non-linearity comments, um, I agree that the back feedback uh, direction uh, is a linear, uh, direction is a linear process, the, but the feed forward part, I can guarantee you, is non-linear. And that's why the universal approximation theorem works and uh, we can you know, approximate any function, etc. But that's just the technical point. The other thing you said about unconscious is very interesting. I think one of the mistakes of early AI was to assume that conscious intelligence was all there is. They went around and asked experts how they arrived at their decisions. And they tried to write expert systems with rules and programs to simulate that. But the thing is, if you ask a chess expert or a Go expert how, let's say, they came up with a particular move, they'll tell you a story, but that story is going to be not very accurate. They don't, in fact, have access to all the reasoning and the thinking machinery in their heads. Uh, in order to give you uh, a complete answer. Similarly, you know, if you, I remember when I was first learning in, the, in Turkish lessons about the Turkish grammar and the word structure and the suffixes, etc. at school, um, I was sort of shocked because I already knew about these things instinctively, but nobody ever actually told me the rules of which suffix was supposed to follow which other suffix. I, I, I knew all of this unconsciously. Right. So if you actually ask a natural language using person, I mean, we all are ex experts in language in a sense, because we can all use language, but nobody knows why or how they're able to do this. Uh, so that because, as you said, all that process uh, is mostly unconscious. I think uh, my personal opinion is that the current deep learning um, revolution or the current deep learning models mostly build systems that look like our unconscious, okay? So we're building systems that are not able to explain themselves or they're not able to, you know, have concrete steps of reasoning uh, like our conscious thought processes, but we train this network and it suddenly is able to recognize cats and dogs without knowing how or why. So I think the, the current models are closer to the human unconscious processes than sort of the type one system, one conscious type of processes. And one of the biggest challenges right now is to marry these two approaches. So the old AI people say, look, we spent a lot of time thinking about these type one conscious rule-based 
sequential processes of thinking. And the deep learning people gave it all up. Uh, but now they're saying in order to get uh, the best of both worlds, we need to combine these approaches, somehow be able to chain together um, a sequence of reasoning, um, explain our decisions, uh, be able to use language, which are all required uh, conscious processes. And nobody knows exactly how to integrate the two right now. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions in the chat box. We may have um, some additional time if you want, if you would like to ask, I mean, you can, you can also just unmute yourself really and ask uh, if you don't want to use the chat box feature. But if not, uh, then I guess we can conclude the, oh, uh, I think Dr. Bullens had a question. Cause you're muted. Um, she... Yeah. Yeah. If you allow a very brief follow-up question. Of course. Uh, I think before we talk about integrating the artificial thing and the human intelligence thing. In economics or psychology, Daniel Kahneman, they call it system one and system two. So thinking without thinking fast and controlled calculating thinking, which is very slow. Before we can talk about integrating, we have to find connections first. That is the first step. We have nothing to integrate yet. And the second point is, and it is one of my fields, because you mentioned language and why it is so difficult to translate that in the literary sense into a computer supported thing. I think that is because the words we use are not only can be, but most of the time are always have a different meaning depending on the intention, the context, the environment, the purpose, etc. So I think what we should need among what we need as a first step is, is a comprehensive theory of meaning. What does meaning? What is the concept of meaning? Because only if you have that, you can start to translate it into something. But the problem will be, as I see it, as I, my research shows me, that the possibilities, the options of different meanings are immense because the complexity of actors, actions, outcomes, sheer numbers, are so complex, are so high, that you have an innumerous uh, amount, number of meanings. So just to, just to uh, yes. think that we should not forget that. The theory of meaning. Yes, I, I wholeheartedly agree on the point you made about the complexity of language. Um, I am sort of, uh, I also agree that a theory of meaning uh, is going to uh, come out of um, or you know, eventually be discovered if we're going to solve language. However, I think there is different ways to arrive at a theory and uh, you can basically um, be a linguist and analyze humans and try to come up with your theory of meaning you can be a data scientist, look at lots of text and look at the way people use language and try to come up with a theory of meaning. Or you can be an AI person and you can write programs and see what these programs are capable of and try to arrive at a theory of meaning. So I think all of these are possibly uh, good approaches. None of them have succeeded completely so far. You're right about that. 
uh, but at least right now, professionally, I'm betting my money on the third option. So let's hope that uh, our camp gets there first. Uh, Jam, did you have a question? I actually do. While you were talking, it just occurred to me that most of the times when we read the press about the latest developments in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, I think the great majority of the publications are either directly informing people, these are the publications in the scientific journals and so on, but in normal daily press, most of the articles you would see are very alarmist towards this. Yes. Uh, so as a person in the field, how would you suggest that we would recommend the students or the people new in the field to take a position to be neutral and objective towards their stance? I'm a, a professor of international relations, mm -hmm. but I work on the issues of science, technology and IR. And oftentimes, therefore, I would like to tell my students to follow the latest developments, not only in social sciences or in IR, but also in other fields to have a more complete understanding of the world. And therefore, then I meet these resistances. So what can you tell to help me on this? Thank you. So uh, thank you for that question. Great question. And uh, I have been approached by journalists and uh, curious students alike to comment on some of these things. Um, so this is a this is a you know daily problem for me as well, uh, and my recommendation is basically this rule I call the two click rule, and I will illustrate this rule with this story. Okay, so about a year or two ago, uh, a new story appeared uh, about Facebook. It said a Facebook research team uh, were working on language, uh, you know, artificial intelligence that generates it, its own language. And these artificial intelligence agents actually started developing their own language that was in, illegible, understandable by the researchers, and they had to pull the plug before the you know, runaway AI took, took over the world or something. Okay, so, so I read this and uh, you know, knowing what I know, I didn't take it seriously, I went home. But the next day, you know, journalists actually asked for comments. So I had to educate myself to find out what's going on. So the two clicks are as follows. I basically went to the article and the article actually points to a blog post by Facebook. So you click on that, you go and read the blog post and the blog post wasn't that uh, ridiculous. The blog post was basically mentioning, you know, they were trying to create two agents that can barter, okay? So it was a very simple game. Agent one has a, a ball and a pen. Agent two has a pencil and a bicycle. And you know, agent one says, okay, I'll give you the ball, you give me the bicycle and vice versa. They have this very restricted language and they're trying to you know, come up with some way to communicate for this bartering game. And at some point during this research, uh, as it often happens in my own research as well, due to some bug in the program or you know, just you know, uh, bad training data, uh, the thing actually started spewing out garbage. Okay, so they were, you know, they were generating. So, for example, if you try to train a machine translation, machine machine translation system, uh, before it converges, you give it a sentence in Turkish, and then the English translation begins da 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 da. Okay, so that doesn't mean the AI is getting too smart and inventing this weird language that humans don't understand. That just means the program didn't work. Okay, when that happens, you hit Control C. You stop the program, you debug it, you fix it, and you restart. That's all that happened. And after that, you know, there's one more click, that's the second click, uh, that actually takes you to the paper that was published. And that wasn't very difficult to understand either. It was a bit more technical, of course, but it basically laid out the rules of the game and the simplicity of the vocabulary that they were using. It was literally a language with 10 words, okay? So it was not enough to take over the world, I don't think. Uh, so after learning all this, you know, I was able to um, communicate this to the journalists who asked me, but very few journalists asked me. So a lot of the journalists, you know, without doing the two click rule, uh, went with the original story written by some irresponsible or, um, I don't know, uh, clickbaity uh, person uh, these days. I don't know why people do the things they do, uh, but that, that story got all the 
uh, clicks. And people subconsciously right now think that there was a you know, runaway AI in some Facebook AI lab and people had to pull the plug. Nothing can be further from the truth. So my, my recommendation to your students is never believe something without clicking at least twice and reading a bit about the background. Thank you, Ajahn. We have one last question uh, from Anul Shan. Again, as I say, no favoritism here. It happens to be the only question left in the chat box. Uh, he's asking, we can model the learning process. Are there any studies modeling intuition? It depends on what you mean by intuition. I think intuition is just the name we give to the output of a process that we can't consciously uh, follow. Okay, so you, I, I, I read about a paper, I start thinking about a problem, I think, 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 nothing comes to mind, I go to bed, I wake up in the morning, and suddenly, intuition, okay? Some solution comes to my mind. Now, where did it come from? Okay, so ancient Greeks used to think that there were, you know, these, uh, spirits that actually gave you inspirations and ideas and stuff. And I don't think that were, they were that far, that far from the truth because, you know, yes, they are given to you by things that are not under your control, but what they call spirits happen to be subconscious processes in your own brain, processes that actually um, continue, uh, you know, with, under the radar of your consciousness. So uh, if that's what intuition is, uh, then yes, I think uh, we are working on uh, what we're building these days are eventually going to be um, sort of building blocks uh, for intuition going forward. But in order to call something intuition, you also need a consciousness and we don't have that yet. So right now it's, uh, it's not that meaningful to talk about. Thank you, Ajam. So in the meantime, we got uh, another question from uh, Emirhan Kurtulush. Do you think that in the future, the growth and the sizes of deep learning models will be restricted by the decreasing level of investment in uh, computer processing, resulting in a point where the current rate of advancements and discoveries will be unachievable? In other words, GPT-3 was trained on enormous resources and after building GPT-4, will it become a must to build supercomputers powered by nuclear power plants next to the research center where GPT-5 will be trained? I never underestimate hardware people. So I remember when I was doing my PhD, this is what, 1996 or something. Um, I, I had a very, very large language model and none of the computers in the lab were able to fit this model because I was actually keeping statistics about word pairs. And if you actually, you know, take it, reasonably sized vocabulary, you know, 10,000, 100,000, the possible word pairs are huge and it didn't fit the current memory. And I begged and begged my advisor to get me a um, super duper computer. He spent about $50,000 that had two gigabytes of memory, which was basically what allowed me to finish my PhD. So that was the biggest uh, badass computer at the MIT AI lab. Um, 25 years ago. Right now, my phone has more memory. So, and I don't think the progress has slowed down. It changed shape. So the individual speeds of individual chips aren't advancing as rapidly as they used to in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. But then the parallelism kicked in and now we have more and more uh, computational units in every chip. So I haven't seen that process slow down yet. So I think, um, I mean, if I was to guess in five to 10 years, GPT-3 will be on your watch. So then that means GPT-5 will be also, um, uh, you know, not that difficult to train. In fact, um, this is something that I observed over the years, the cutting, any, the cutting edge in AI is determined by what a single PhD student can do with the current days hardware in about a week. Okay, if anything beyond that is unfortunately beyond our science right now, because basically, if you think about it, every new method, every new algorithm takes a PhD student working on this thing, right? 
And if the turnaround of his experiments, his or her experiments, is more than about a week, then you can't really debug that idea. You lose your concentration, you forget what you were doing, you get a homework, you know, you have to TA and stuff, and that never works out. So if you follow throughout history, the cutting edge methods that were invented, they all correspond to what that particular day's hardware can do in about a couple of days to a week. Okay, so that basically limits, unfortunately, our creativity. And that, as that limit increases, the types of things we can do will also increase with it. Thank you very much, Rajan. We are actually approaching the end of the seminar, but um, Dr. Bullens had another question. If you have an additional one or two minutes, uh, could we address that too? Yeah, no problem. Okay, if you could unmute yourself. It's actually me and not him. So this is okay. <laughs> asking the question. Sorry for the confusion. But just to follow up on what you said, like when we are sure of what we see on the internet, it's of course very uh, advantageous and beneficial to go and do these double clicks. But just because you have shown us how deep fake is configured and done, yeah. when you were actually showing it, I just wondered, for example, what could be the future of a discourse analysis? Yeah. How would a social scientist be able to distinguish Obama's original authentic speeches from the yeah. deep faked ones? Yeah. So how dangerous do you see and where is this going? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. So um, currently we can still distinguish, even if uh, human eye can't distinguish, at least in photographs, we're we just got to the level where uh, humans have a hard time distinguishing real human faces from fake human faces. We're not at that level uh, at video and voice yet. Uh, I'm sure you could tell some imperfections in Obama's face and the tone of his voice. They weren't quite there yet, but we'll get there. And as we get there, then we'll adjust. I mean, if we can't tell the difference, then we're going to have to stop relying on video as evidence. So um, I think humans are infinitely adjustable and creative in terms of finding solutions to new problems. So that will sort of, uh, you know, get us to a new age where in a court of law, it used to be that if you can actually hear the recording of this person's voice or here's a recording of their video, then the defense will be able to say, no, that video is fake. And uh, you, know, you can't prove otherwise. So that will be, uh, it will not be possible to use those things as evidence. Thank you so much, Ajam. I think with that, we can uh, conclude the seminar. Again, I mean, I myself really enjoyed and learned a lot uh, in the seminar. It was really thought provoking and we also had a really lively debate. So another big thank you goes to our audience uh, for their questions. Um, Hojab, would you like to say any last words? Um, well, thank you for coming and uh, bearing with me. And uh, thank you for inviting me, Mary. That was great. It was fun. a true pleasure. Thank you, Hojab. Uh, and another note, we have a one last seminar before uh, the end of this semester with uh, Dr. Roxana Radu. In two weeks again, we will be posting um, further information soon. Um, she is the chair of the Internet Society in Switzerland, and she will be talking about AI governance. Uh, so thank you all very much again and hope to see you. Well, I have to make this joke. See you next year. <laughs> Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you.